Yes, hi, I'm Dr. Roger Mastalish, and I'm president of the Amazon Center for Environmental Education and Research. If we never challenge the underlying forces that create global hunger in the first place, all we will ever have are soup kitchens. And in my mind, I think we can do better than that. Well, we're going to need to develop a new environmental ethic. Uh, we've used conservation strategies for years now to protect large tracts of the Amazon and other parts around the world. Those strategies have been somewhat successful, but if you crunch the numbers, you're going to see that the rate of change, the pace of habitat destruction, the impacts of global warming are outstripping our capacity to buy land, to put it aside, to cajole people into protecting it, or other conventional strategies. So here's a plan for Amazonia. First is, you know, we actually don't know much about the, the rainforest. We know some of it, but we really don't know how it works, and yet we're dismantling an intact system before we even know what's going on. We need to do more species inventories. Mike Ballack of New York Botanical Garden estimates that maybe there's up to 300 species of potentially valuable medicinal plants in the rainforest right now. Everybody needs to do what they think they can do to make a difference, and there's there certainly is a need when there is an emergency or when there is an extreme circumstance um, to raise some serious questions. And so advocacy groups that do that uh, certainly serve that role. However, I think that if that's all you do, then uh, you're missing an opportunity for a fundamental shift. The reality is that this planet and the people who live on it are going to want energy sources. They're going to want materials. They're going to want an improved quality of life. So I think it's better to uh, look at strategies that engage everybody on the planet and coming up with a different conservation paradigm as opposed to simply hammering someone. If there's an emergency and if somebody is going in, and, and for example, we've had experiences with indigenous groups that have their uh, property and have their language and have their very livelihood threatened, that certainly is a case for strong and immediate advocacy. But I think that you're more likely to see long-term change in the way that we're talking about it in terms of uh, paradigm shift by getting everybody not to be w moving from a place of fear but moving from a place of intention to simply make life on this planet a little bit better and to do it in a way that is sustainable so that we don't have a win-lose situation but that we have a win-win with all the people who are involved. We really need village-based education. When I go, I go into villages where the per capita income is less than $50 a year if they have any monetary economy at all. And we talk to these people, and you know, it's pretty hard for gringos to go into uh, some of the villages where they have that kind of economy and say, oh, by the way, don't cut, don't cut your trees down. You know, when they have 50% of their national territory protected, and they, they come back at us and say, what are you doing to protect your old growth forest in the Northwest, of which only 1% list is left? So I, I can't go there and be hypocritical. And so I, I, we, we engage in conversations with them, but you know what they tell me is, they get their stake in intact ecosystems like this. I don't have to twist around and say, oh, by the way, you know, you really need to save this because of X, Y, and Z. They already get it. But they also say to me, where are we gonna, what are we gonna eat tomorrow? Or, you know, I don't, I, I wanna send my kids to the next village so that they can go to secondary school and maybe get a college education. How am I gonna do that if I have no money? So if a timber company comes down and says, you know what, I'll give you $25 for this tree right here, you would take it, and they take it. But that's only because the model is skewed. If we think about the value of the forest intact, uh, we can introduce into these villagers a, a different set of options. And of course, what, what John is doing in the book is a perfect example. So empowerment of local villages is, is really essential if we're gonna move this along. So this is what we do. We basically believe, uh, with the Asir Foundation, that you have to bring, a, first of all, awareness to what's going on, which is what this is. And I'm hoping that all of you are getting the message. I suspect that you are. Uh, and that's going to motivate uh, people to take action because, um, you know, somebody said to a climatologist, God, aren't you uh, nervous about uh, or worried about this dire prediction about all these models and stuff like that? And he said, actually, no, I'm an optimist. And, and they said, well, why? And he said, because in my heart of hearts, I just can't believe that we would be so stupid. We've, we have had a, a number of uh, companies and, and institutions that have uh, come to our support. Uh, the one that we are working with most uh, recently is the Amazon Herb Company. Uh, Amazon Herb has an, uh, a business operation in Pucallpa in the central jungles of Peru. They work with the Shipibo people and they uh, obtain and harvest uh, a variety of uh, botanical medicines from the rainforest that they then make into uh, uh, botanical supplements that they sell throughout the world. Well, if you believe that education is power, what's really going on here is fundamental empowerment. 
And when you have a, a village school that has perhaps maybe 20 kids, a teacher that gets paid $30 a month, has just three months of professional training after high school, has to teach six classes simultaneously, grades first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, with no books, no papers, no pencils, or if they have books, they're from Lima that show microwave ovens, cars, televisions, VCRs. What do you think the message is that in, in these rural villages? You can, you can imagine what the message is. So when John referenced our first culturally sensitive curriculum, it's really important that Amazon people, in, in looking at um, their role and their stake in the area, uh, see it from their eyes, from their experience. And so um, this project, as John said, is just beginning to start. Uh, this coming fall, we'll start a series of teacher training programs to get um, these teachers up to, up to speed on how to engage in experiential learning, which is uncommon in Peru. Uh, relating to conservation. And then we also engage in uh, community service projects through this program, and so we're already talking with John about what some of the villages need in terms of maybe they need a boat. Uh, we just did a uh, medical mission uh, in this one village because of the uh, particularly dire uh, health status of these villagers. And we've built libraries and we've built uh, um, community centers and, and um, have used solar power on a couple schools to uh, address the needs that the community has articulated. Okay, here's how you can help. Uh, first of all, you have to get involved, but all of you already are involved, so I would say certainly continue to get involved. Reduce your environmental footprint. I'm glad that, I know there was some conversation about turning the air conditioning off in this room as a green gesture, but I'm actually glad that that wasn't done. <laughs> Insist on action to mitigate global climate change. Um, you don't have to do this for the Amazon, you can do this for your own hometown, to find a way to simply insist on mitigating uh, this phenomenon, because as the DVD said, we are close to a tipping point. Advocate for social justice. This has everything to do with, with foreign relations with countries like Peru and Brazil and Bolivia, uh, as well as just advocating for the right of indigenous people to own their land, to speak their language, to have an education, to succeed.